Carolyn Farrell is here with us again, and she is our expert. Uh, today, you are going to teach us some more about Cave Johnson and the monuments here. So please, tell, tell us the story. Cave Johnson was in Congress for 14 years and very well respected. He was one of the men who surrendered to Clarksville when it was invaded by the uh, Union Navy in February of 1862. Uh, he was buried in 1866, probably at the Trinity Episcopal uh, Cemetery on uh, Main Street. But because that cemetery became uh, landlocked, they moved him here. When the cemetery was opened, uh, they brought him here. This is the uh, Johnson plot. And it was purchased from uh, the cemetery, the first one to be purchased from the cemetery uh, by Pope Grundy Johnson, his son. So his son purchased all this yes. and then had his father. And the Trinity Cemetery, I mean, that in itself is a story, that, that it, it <clears throat> filled up and it was landlocked, couldn't grow anymore. So they actually paid someone to move all the graves. Uh, George Cook was a member of the Trinity, and they actually traded him the land for moving all the bodies over to either the city cemetery or to uh, Greenwood. And uh, th this, it wasn't just because the cemetery became landlocked that they had to move it. That part of Clarksville after the Civil War became an area where there were a lot of saloons and not very nice neighborhoods moving in, and the ladies could not feel safe going and visiting graves there. They were actually verbally abused uh, when they were at their family's uh, plots, and they did not feel safe. So, so they moved. They so moved. Trinity moved. Yes. That's very interesting. So Cave Johnson is one of the older people yes. that's, that's buried, one of the oldest monuments. Yes. So his family, now tell us, okay, so Cave Johnson, and, and we know that Cave lived over there in the house next door to where Nanny Tyler. Well, he lived actually around the corner okay. on Madison Street. Okay. Uh, the, the house that is on Madison Street marked as his house. That's it's right. not actually the real house. It burned down and uh, they rebuilt it like the original. But Cave Johnson, when he died, he was living with his, uh, let's see, that would be his stepdaughter over at the Rob house. Okay. And so his son, Polk Grundy, Grundy. And, and Polk is buried right here. Right here. Okay. Tell us about, I mean, this is a huge monument. Tell us a little bit uh, about it itself. It's, it's, it's saying I was an important person. When you, <laughs> when, you, when you see a large monument like this, uh, it's interesting that he made his monument or had his monument made larger than his father's. Who was postmaster general. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So it says a lot. But Pope Grundy was very powerful. He was a clerk uh, with a court in Clarksville. He owned a lot of land. He, uh, of course, married twice. He married Emma Robb, and then he married Nanny Tyler, the sister of Judge Tyler. And uh, his family is buried here. His first wife is here with the, the children that they lost. And Nanny, his second wife, with the children that they lost, are all buried here within the same section. You know, we know that at that time, it was not uncommon for people to lose their young right, children. Right. And what a tragedy. In, in the monument itself, I, I know we talked a little bit about Victorian times and, and that there was a lot of symbolism right. on the actual monument. And so sometimes when we look at these monuments, we see sort of unusual features. Right. Um, and, and we don't, we, in, in our time period, we don't quite get the language. Right. So like this, um, it, it almost looks very ghostly, these things on each it's side. It's meant to be. Uh, this is probably one of the most common uh, funerary uh, art that is done at this time. It is an urn, and it is draped, and it is showing the earthly remains, and of course the drapes saying the separation between what is earthly and what is heavenly. Ah. So it's a whole language right. of icons and symbols within the cemetery, and some of them are meant to be complementary and some of them are not meant to be complimentary. You just need to know how to read them. And obviously you can read them. So within this Johnson family, um, take us through the, the rest of the family so we can see their monuments. And if there is something in this, in this language, this funerary art, maybe you can point it out to us. Okay. Cave was a son of uh, Pope Grundy and his second wife, uh, Nanny Tyler. Uh, he was in the Spanish-American War and was wounded or became ill. I think he became ill during uh, that war and never really recovered. He was probably in his 20s when he passed away. So this was a real blow. When you get a child, uh, your, your child passed 
childhood, you think they've got a good chance to go on and, and live, right. and yet uh, this tragedy befell them. Mm -hmm. So they named, Pope Grundy named his son Cave after, after his Cave. father he, Cave. Yes, after his grandfather. Grandfather. Right. And so on this monument, do we see anything in no, the funerary? No, this is very plain. And, very plain. And so over here, though, we have, uh, these are an extended family. These are the Garlands, and uh, Betty Garland was the uh, stepdaughter of uh, Alfred Robb. So this is, this is really the in-laws okay. over here. And again, her name is Nanny. Right. Uh, so we do continue to see that name, right. but this is very elaborate. Um, you've got uh, the stone uh, upon this rock, I will build my church. You've got an open Bible uh, or an open book uh, saying that all my life is known to God. And you've got obviously a woman that's grieving and holding onto a, a cross, meaning that she's leaning on her faith. And you know, I think that without your explanation, we, we feel that but having you explain it really does make sense and as you say explains the funerary right. art and so this was extended family right take us back over to the johnsons where we see you you had said that they had lost twins okay they would be over here i believe they died within a month of each other and this would have been the children of emma rob and Pope Bunny Johnson. So they're buried together. And this has been, you, you really can't read this very well. No, not it, very it, well. It's so old. Tell us about this in terms of funerary art. Okay, again you've got the cross that is holding the two together. This is obviously a child's grave. It's much smaller, much simpler, but you've got this, the, the cross here, again relaying the, the faith of the family that they are going to see these children again. They had such a strong faith. Even though you lost a child, they rest in assurance that because of their faith and what they believe, that these children would be seen by them again. Hmm. And who do we, ha okay, here is. This is the mother. This is the first wife, uh, Pope Grundy. And you can tell how much she was loved. He had a very ornate uh, monument made for her. You've got the lilies up at the top representing okay. purity. Okay. And you've got the vines uh, winding around the outside, oh, right which of here. course means everlasting life. Oh. And, uh, and th the very shape of it almost looks like a church. I mean, it looks like yes. a gothic window. Yes. Very ornate. It, it says a lot about uh, his, his feelings towards her. Mm -hmm. Now, she was born in 1845, so uh, th these are quite old. I mean, this is right. pre-Civil War and died in 1872. Right. So do we think that she, that this grave was moved or would she have been able to have had her original internment here? I'm trying to remember when the cemetery actually opened here. Um, it was in 72. So it's possible this could yes. have been original yes. in 72. Right. So we have Cave Johnson. So we really have all the Johnson. Yes. Is there anybody that we did not point? Well, the, the second wife, Nanny Tyler, the sister of Judge Tyler is buried here, and because of this large tree under us, a limb fell and about obliterated her name off of it. I, I don't know something. I wish something could be done about that. That's that's very sad. Her daughter. Now there's a son. Okay. This is the daughter, Mildred, who died. Uh, we have a portrait of her uh, in her twenties, and so she did live beyond uh, childhood. Very attractive young lady. And again, these are very simple. We're not yes. seeing a, a lot yes. of symbolism. No. Uh, but you, you know this cemetery so well, and you had told me about a number of different stories, and, and I, I hope that we can take a look at some of those. But there was one other that, that just dominates the cemetery, and that, of course, is the, conf the Confederate monument. Wow. Uh, and so I'd like for us to, to take a look at that and okay. have you tell us, I mean, this absolutely dominates the, the entrance, and um, as you pointed out, the Johnsons bought this plot early on, and it was the, one of the prime, yes. and, and I guess because it was located by the Confederate Memorial. Well, the, the memorial actually came later. Okay. Uh, there was actually a discussion on where to place it. One thought was, and it was very heavily argued, was that it would go in the yard of the courthouse. Ah. And uh, for whatever reason, it was 
chosen to be here. Now, the person who had the final say over the design was Charles Tyler because he was a financial officer, okay. so he's, he's watching after this. But this monument is uh, actually made from actual photographs of people who lived in Clarksville who fought in the Civil War. We've got Clay Stacker over here. On the who, left? Yes, who as a cadet fought in the Battle of Newmarket, and he has his name engraved on a monument at uh, VMI in Lexington, Virginia. I just saw that and photographed that this summer. So Clay Stacker uh, is a part of Clarksville history forever. Uh, he was uh, pictured as the cavalryman. The artilleryman was uh, Charles Bailey. And up at the top is Robert Bringhurst. And Robert Bringhurst is, uh, is being honored at the top for the reason that he was one of the three that did not survive the Civil War. Oh. He, he died at the Battle of Franklin. He actually had a furlough in his pocket. And this is a sad story. So, so Such a sad story. He had a furlough to actually come home. He'd already been wounded at the Battle of Atlanta. He could come home and bypass the whole uh, battle, but he went to the field on crutches and he told General Quarles that I'm there to support my boys. So he went out into the battlefield and was shot eight times, laid on the ground. It was November 30th, very, very cold laid there all night long in the cold and died a couple of days later. So they are honoring him by placing him at the top. He is not buried here. He is buried over at the city cemetery known as Riverview. And you know, I, I think that uh, seeing a, a Confederate memorial, we all know, is a very common uh, monument in, in many towns in the South. Right. This one is very large yes. and uniquely that it has real Clark's Villians. Right. So who, who paid for this? How was it that, that Clarksville really went to such expense to have this? The people who uh, spearheaded it were the Forbes Bivouac, named after uh, Forbes, who was in the Battle of uh, Manassas. And uh, the Forbes Bivouac was like any bivouac where you had a brotherhood or a membership of veterans from the Civil War. And they come together, they have their meetings, they have their officers, they, they go to reunions together. They keep alive the memory of the men who died and who gave you know everything for their country. And so they spearheaded this. And Charles Tyler, who of course was a member of Forbes Bivouac, he was in the uh, 50th Tennessee. Uh, and uh, he, he actually was the final say on the design of the the uh, statue or the uh, monument itself, and they, they raised the money in Clarksville and had the statue made, a foot or the monument made. The funny story about this is it was so large that when they got the monument here, I think it was made in Chicago, uh, they got it to the train station and the man who had uh, done the work behind it thought that the railroad's depot was right next to the cemetery. So they've got this huge monument with no way to get it from the, from the depot over here to the cemetery. So the man has to go back to Chicago, get some trucks, drive them all the way to Clarksville to get this thing set up in the cemetery. Oh, man. That it was that... a mess getting this, this thing set up. Oh. In fact, it almost missed its unveiling day. Now, how did, how did that happen? You mean because, because of all Because of the, the delay. Ah. And the, the, uh, the unveiling of the uh, monument was uh, tragic and uh, had a tragic event happen with it. Uh, it was unveiled by uh, Hope Gracie. And when she pulled the cord to unveil it, the veil didn't draw. And so she's tugging on it. And it's like they're, they're, there's a moment there where they're not sure what to do. All the audience is saying, oh, please. And then they start singing. Molly Tyler is starting to sing. And just as she starts to sing, the thing comes down. Oh. But there's a gun salute given to honor, like they do at any military uh, ceremony. And one of the men who is plunging the cannonball or the, the charge down into the canyon, cannon, it mischarged and it blows his hand off and the ramrod goes flying off in, uh, to the crowd. Oh my gosh. And so they have to uh, get him and uh, take care of business and you know make it to where the women didn't see too much and get him out of the cemetery so they continue with the ceremony. Oh my gosh, that is, <laughs> uh, talk about bringing history to life. That, that's <laughs> unbelievable. Right. Oh, well, there are so many stories here. Stay with us. We will be right back. We're going to take you to another part of the cemetery, and there are some, at least one, kind of uplifting story here. <laughs> one of the really interesting stories that we have, and, and this is probably one of the, it's almost a soap opera. It's, it it's just a sad, tell us, I mean, clearly, this is an unusual monument. 
tell us a little bit about this. This is Blanche Lewis, and she was born to the uh, family of one of the well wealthy iron workers in Clarksville and actually Stewart County. And uh, she was a beautiful young lady, was a student at the Clarksville Academy, was engaged to a young man who, like everybody else in Clarksville that was of age, left for the Civil War. His name was Augustus Tarwater, and uh, he went to war, was actually a prisoner of war, lived through that, came back to Clarksville, they set their wedding day. They were getting ready for their wedding on uh, Christmas Day, and uh, he had caught a cold up north on a uh, business trip and was sick up until the day that uh, they were to be married, and then he died on the day of their wedding. Oh my gosh, on the day of the their day wedding. Of the wedding. And they had already sent out wedding invitations, or were getting ready to, and so they turned the back of the wedding uh, invitation over and put the funeral invitation. And at the time when you oh. received a funeral invitation, you were bound by honor to attend. Oh. It wasn't a question of whether you would or you were supposed to attend. And so she lived out her life still in love with him and uh, lived to be in her 60s and wanted to be buried next to him here. And so she is. And so in her, in this monument, is there anything that you can tell us symbolically? Well, she's holding lilies again, which will represent uh, purity and she's holding one in her hand here. Uh, my question has always been, why is a statue made to look this direction? If he's buried over here, why wouldn't she be looking at yeah, him? She would be, maybe it was because the other plots had been bought by the time this was the only one open. But she's actually facing away. This is uh, Augustus's brother, Hiram, who married her sister. Oh, now this is his. This is his grave. And, and so this, um, he, she is buried next to him. Yes. Tell us about this symbolism. The vine, uh, of course, is representing <laughs> everlasting life again, and it's trailing upward. You've got the column, which again is showing significance. Uh, you know, the column always represents something of importance. So again, his uh, his uh, monument is very stately. Okay, so here is Augustus that died on their wedding day. Yes and Augustus's brother. Right, who married her sister, Sally. There were two brothers and two sisters in love. Oh, what and a sad story. They had a child that they named Augustus, and he died very young. Oh, this is a tragic, uh, tragic story. Yes. And so the symbolism here and here is, is plain, I think, to us. Right. Are there any others that are close around here that, that you see that have some symbolism that, that we haven't really seen? Uh, not in this general area because you can see that there's some, some plain uh, ones over here, but there are plenty throughout the cemetery, there's, and there's a whole language here. And I know you've taken the time to learn this language, and we did promise that we were going to have one uplifting story. So let's let's go find that one uplifting story. Okay. okay. We do have one uplifting story, and Carolyn, I think this is great. And what I really like too is the way you discovered it. And you know, a lot of these graves we don't have; uh, they're hard to read. Right. So tell us the trick to being able to read this. Well, a lot of people are familiar with using uh, a pencil and, and doing the little rubbing and so forth. What, using a paper. Using uh, the paper. Yeah, yes. and, and okay. What I do is I take just plain cooking, you know, baking flour, dry, and I take it and I push it up. And you can tell where I've done that. You push it up and it'll make the, uh, the writing come or stand out like a negative. And so it's much easier to read. It doesn't hurt the stone. It's washed out when it rains. Right. So that's, that's my technique. That is a great technique. And this is, okay, th this uh, monument, tell us, this was a significant person. Right, uh, but he's done something really unique here. Most monuments are meant to be talking about the person. He's reversed it. He's, he's welcoming uh, the people coming to visit him. And his, his uh, little writing here says, glad to see you call again. May God ever bless the living. Uh, and it says, and may the flowers around 
the grass of the dead ever bloom, or the graves of the dead ever bloom. Uh -oh. He's turned it around. It's a it's right. A, like, Instead of sadness yes. coming to visit, he's saying, "Happy to see you. Yeah, thank you Thanks for, for coming. Me. Yeah. So it's a, it's a very uplifting, and uh, I wish I knew more about the person. It's Elzar, uh, but that's that. He turned it around. Well, and knowing you, I know that there's a lot of detective work ahead, and you will find out about I this fellow. About you him. will. And he is in a beautiful setting. Right. Tell us. You know, Greenwood Cemetery itself, uh, people can still be buried here. Yes. It, you know, we look at all these really old tombstones, but people really can still be buried here. And there are also, I mean, there's so many graves here. Do you have any idea how many? I think there's something like 13,000 plus. Ah. And they can expand. There's like 100 acres here, mm -hmm. and as they need, they expand the cemetery like they did in this section over here behind the mausoleum. Okay, and then there are places where they're not going to put. Not so ever. show, kind of point that out to us. Okay, we are over here on the rim of what is called the bowl. The bowl. Or the sunken garden. Okay. And, uh, this was probably natural, uh, it is natural. Uh, one of Clarksville's famous little sinkholes that we have. Yes. And uh, it was designed not to have anything major growing in it. These trees, again, were probably planted by the squirrel. And if you'll look right there through those two trees, you'll see some stairs going down to the yes, to yes. sunken garden. At the time that Herbert Gorth uh, designed and landscaped uh, Greenwood, he had a gazebo down here. There were park benches all around because this was a park-like setting. And uh, it was, again, the thinking of the time is to make a graveyard attractive, welcoming, and comforting. And so he had places for people to sit and visit. Mm -hmm. And they would come off the trolley cars, have picnics here in the cemetery. And uh, Sam Beatty, uh, let's see, was it Beatty or maybe Hicks, uh, they actually sparked here in the cemetery. They courted oh. in the cemetery <laughs> because it was a park-like setting. There were other people around, which was very proper. Right. So, uh, but no burials are ever going to be allowed in the sunken garden. Well, I have to comment, you know, you said that the squirrels buried a lot of the, the <laughs> nuts and, and, and are responsible for all these beautiful oak trees. This, they couldn't have done a better job. They did a very good job. It is such a beautiful setting. And as you said, it is comforting. And when you, I, I, because this is a history show, we, of course, love history, and we're surrounded by it. Yes. You know, I think that this really sums up everything we try to do when we talk about our history and our heritage. Right. So I thank you for very teaching us, and we'll do this again. Remember, it's your history and your heritage.